What's up, guys? Welcome to episode six of the PJF podcast. Look, we got some major, major, major gems today. We had a great conversation. Uh, most of what we we're talking about is building the base for a freak vertical. So if you're looking at really transforming uh, your vertical jump and your athleticism, how do we set up that initial build the base phase? And so I took you uh, through the process of how I built vert code phase one. Um, and this is very important because you've got to learn the traits of what we need to focus on uh, for long-term athletic success. Uh, after that, we got into a speed round. We covered a ton of topics from training related questions uh, to basketball questions uh, to just general life stuff. So good entertainment and actually some gems in that speed round as well. Let's do it. You're listening to the PJF podcast, a show dedicated to decoding elite sports performance and fitness. I'm Paul Fabritz, and I'm an MBA strength and conditioning and performance trainer. If you want to become superhuman, take your fitness and take your sports performance to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's do it. So this is game five, right? Yes. So I want Golden State to win this game, and then I want Toronto to win the next game, because guess what that means? That Golden State lost at Oracle for the last? Nope. For... It means that... Toronto won in six. Well, that's what I called at the start. That's cool. But what's cooler, six in six. Ah. Uh, Drake album. Six in the six. Uh. Six in six. Or raps in six. Because he's uh. rapping in the six. Are you going to get credit for this? I need I need some credit. Just that's like one percent of profit. I think it's well, not that much to ask for. I'll take literally 0.001%. I was going to say, I was going right. to say, I'll take, yeah, 0.001% is definitely going to turn. That's nice. Yeah, that's, that's Raps a living. in six. All right. So building the base for optimal vertical jump improvements. I think the reason why I want to talk about this the most today is because I got a comment the other day and it, it was in a response to the Dr. Andy Galpin episode. And you got to keep in mind when people listen to these episodes, they think they're professional strength coaches afterwards. That's fair. Right. So that's the, that's the byproduct of what we're doing here. So I get a message cause I posted like this balance drill, um, to my Instagram story and this dude hits me up and he goes, dude, that is not at all what you talked about on the episode. Why would you do this low level work? He's like, that's not intense. And he's like, that's you're, you're lying to your audience by saying that you have to do everything intense. And then now you're not doing that. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Context. <laughs> Context. There's Context. so much more to it. There's hundreds of qualities that we're trying to improve. In that episode, we're strictly talking about fast twitch muscle fibers. Yeah. And that is only one of many, many things that we have to improve on. And that's like the pinnacle. That's that's like when you have the prerequisites. Exactly. The context. Exactly. Man, context and is so, important. You know, he thought he thought it was a good time to actually call me out on that, but he just didn't understand. And, and I, I figured if he's like that, then maybe there's a few more out there that took that as like, oh, we don't do anything else other than super heavy and super fast. Even though in the episode, I also mentioned that we do slow stuff as well for the tendons. Anyways, it's important to understand the That's, process, the total it, process. And it's so important to, first of all, build a base because mm -hmm. so many people get excited about vertical gains and they go straight into the intense plyometrics, straight into the super heavy explosive lifting, uh, but they don't actually build that base. So yeah. I want to talk about kind of how we build uh, the vert code elite, how we build that base and set you up for long-term development. Definitely. So first of all, Nothing that we do in our phase one, and for us, our phase one is four weeks. Nothing that we do is extremely high intensity. So we're not going to lift super heavy and we're not going to go all out on plyometrics, right? Uh, we are going to be building our base and leading towards that. So there's a few things that we have to enhance in that phase one. Uh, step one, we need to improve our mechanics mm -hmm. because not only from a improved performance standpoint, but from an injury reduction standpoint, if we're getting into a vertical jump program and we don't know how to jump and land, do you think that's going to go very well? We're Definitely not. absolutely going to break down right away, whether that's knee problems or whether that's shin splints, whatever, you know, we're going to get in some sort of overuse injury right away. Then we are going to work on our, our approach mechanics as well, because like we talked about in the last episode, 
skill is number one. Exactly. Jump skill is number one. And then we got question, follow up questions on that. And, and people said, well, is, isn't some of that genetic? That's the good news. None of that is genetic. Exactly. When it comes to jump skill, when it comes to mechanics, that's all built. Yeah. And you can get confused thinking that's genetic when really that's just probably childhood exactly. differences. It's just that's what the you were thing. doing as a kid. Yep. That's the thing is people don't know how to differentiate. So they mm. sometimes they say, well, this guy doesn't consciously work on this and he, this guy doesn't even train and he still does windmill dunks. Well, he built that skill through young childhood reps exactly. over and over and over again. And so that's something that he developed um, that is not genetic. So um, now the thing is, most people didn't get that level of reps, right? And so now we got to go back and we got to improve the mechanics. Uh, we got to do a little bit extra work for them. So um, improving our mechanics is number one. And this is why like, we get a ton of crazy transformations in week one, two, three, mm -hmm. four, which when I set up the program, I didn't expect any gains in this first. Like we're literally building a house and we're building the foundation. You know, we're not trying to build the house, right? It's just the foundation. And so uh, I didn't expect to have any gains at all. So that's probably been like the biggest surprise for me is the insane transformations that people are making early on. Would you anticipate that's just from people maybe, you know what I mean, spending so much time trying to get to that level five, level six without ever doing the level one, level two. So they went back and they finally actually went and did it and were patient enough for level that. two. And so those things just connected. Yes, it's that and it's mechanics. Mm -hmm. They're improving their mechanics. So we have a whole jump mechanics guide. And then sometimes, you know, I have them film themselves and then watch our mechanics guide and compare and find out what you're doing wrong. A lot of times you're, you're jumping so wrong that you just make that one proper correction and, and all of a sudden you can really take off. Now that's not a long-term motor Ingram. That is more short-term. So you get this big gain and then you got to go do that every day exactly. to, to it out. build it into a long-term uh, skill, right? But that's where you see the huge transformations early on is people just transforming their mechanics. But I think it also is that it's like, you know, there, there's a lot of people who just jump forward or they go straight into heavy lifting. They, they, they skip this building the base phase. And so they have all of these energy links, leaks. They have all of these um, muscles that are highly underactive, right? Your foot, feet muscles, mm -hmm. because you've been playing in shoes for years. Your ankles are weak. Um, your glutes, like a lot of times people don't even fire their glutes the right way. Like you might be doing heavy hip thrusts and you think you're doing the right thing, but you actually feel it more in your back, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we can simply do like some, uh, we do like a lot of isometric stuff in our phase one because we can get that mind muscle connection. Exactly. We can literally hold there in a single leg hip bridge, shoulder elevated hip bridge position and just think about squeezing that glute as hard as you possibly can. Yeah, that's, that's, that's probably enough for a lot of people. Like, it is. <laughs> that's the thing. Like if, if you're truly getting that mind muscle connection and squeezing as hard as you can, by the end of the set, you're almost going to cramp up. Oh, yeah. Like even the advanced athletes can't go past like, you know, 30 seconds of a hard, hard, hard squeeze. Yeah. And so you're actually activating the right muscles. Uh, whereas your whole life, you may have never activated all the muscle exactly. fibers yeah. the in your glutes. Kinetic chain's been way off. Yeah, yeah. So everything is thrown off. You have all of these energy leaks, um, especially in the feet. So like we do a lot of work, um, especially on like our Tuesday, Thursdays. We do a lot of isolated stuff uh, for the feet. We get out of your shoes. Uh, we go barefoot and we do a ton of isolated stuff. Now, you're not going to do this the entire program, but this is just something that we do early on because you have so many of these intrinsic muscles in your feet that are underactive. Yeah. They're leaking energy. Remember, we're, we're creating all this force high up in the chain. You that, hear that force means nothing unless all of that energy reaches the floor. Yeah, you hear that all the time. Feet are the foundation. Yeah. Feet are the foundation. So if, if all of that energy has to go through our feet and then reach the floor and we have weak feet, underactive feet, then where is that force going? Where's that energy going? It's leaking out. So um, that is one area where I think people are getting those huge gains. Um, I think initially when I was building the program, I underestimated how direct of an effect that was going to have. Mm -hmm. um, and actually there was a recent study, I just saw it today, showing that um, change of direction significantly improved when toe strength improved. 
which is it's like one of those things toe strength foot strength it's one of those things that like you sit down 10 really good trainers and all of them would be like yeah it absolutely changes performance but there was not like a ton of data on this so exactly. it's kind of good to like put the data behind these other 10 trainers who are like for sure it works exactly get some correlation Everybody exactly the same page yep um yeah so i mean improve mechanics um we're we have to own positions uh, a lot of times we just don't own positions and we get into this higher level stuff and we don't own all uh, position, foundational positions that we need in basketball. Mm -hmm. We have something called groove sets where you literally just stand in a split stance and we go low and then we just shift forward and backward and forward and backward and you're getting a little bit of a shoulder tilt and we're just shifting our body weight and you realize the majority of kids can't shift they can't in shift in a stationary position. Yeah. So why would we be doing advanced agility, dynamic agility, when they don't have the ability to shift at the core of it, right? And so we do these groove sets uh, where you're not only, it's not strength, it's not just the being in that low position, we get some isometric strength, we get a lot of this internal external rotation in that low position in the hip, uh, which a lot of athletes don't have, but we're learning how to contract and relax and contract and exactly. relax. Exactly, control in those spots. Control and that's one of the biggest um, overlooked aspect of a phase one is contract, relax to me. I think in phase one, most people are doing like this really slow eccentric stuff, which is cool. It has its place, but mm -hmm. that's kind of teaching the muscle to be on, 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 on. And then we go up and we're still on and then we go back down and we're on. And that's not how we actually perform. We perform off on, off on, yeah, off on. Especially as basketball players. Yeah. Especially, yeah. And both offensively and defensively, you're on, you're off reacting, you're on, change of direction, basketball, pace, tempo. Yep. Yep. So I, we, we train to own positions and we do that in a lot of different ways. Like I'm talking about with the groove sets, but we do a lot of um, isometric stuff because I think isometrics are the best to te for teaching people how to own certain positions. Mm -hmm. Like there's certain vulnerable positions that basketball players have, like, the, yeah. the deepest part of a lunge like there's certain yeah. areas you see where that with old school coaching too i mean if you look back and you know what i mean in terms of, of coaching defense you know the first thing a coach old school coach has you do is sit down in a defensive stance as low as possible and hold it for as long as you yeah. can yep you know what i mean so it's yep. really you know taking that and progressing that to absolutely exactly so it's like if you can't sit in that position in an isometric contraction why would we expect you to be able to move explosively exactly. now so um yeah, there's a lot there, there there's a lot of reasons why. And so first of all, in my old program, I went with that traditional um, that traditional approach of eccentric first. Mm -hmm. You know, eccentric first and then we go into isometrics and then we go into uh, concentrics. I switched eccentric and isometrics because I found out how valuable the isometrics are early on from activating more total muscle fibers. Isometrics are huge, right? If we if I'm testing EMG and I'm we, we base our scores off of a MVIC, max voluntary isometric contraction. That's for a reason. It's because when we hold an isometric contraction and we go maximal with it, we're going to activate a ton of muscle exactly. fibers. Exactly, recruit everybody. Yeah, we're, we're recruiting everybody. So, um, so that's one reason is in that phase, I want to activate all these muscle fibers. Another reason that we switched it out for isometrics is mind-muscle connection. Um, if I'm sitting there in a hip bridge and I need to learn how to activate my glutes, we're taking away the complexity mm -hmm. of movement, right? So I'm not doing like an RDL and then trying to squeeze my glutes because now I'm worried about the complexity of the movement. Exactly. Itself. Too much to think about. Yeah. And of course we teach hip hinge and all this stuff, but as far as like, like strictly getting that mind muscle connection, I don't think you can do any better than an isometric hold. And we'll give the old bodybuilder cue of, um, of light it up red so mm -hmm. like a, i think it was an arnold schwarzenegger cue where he he would say your body is in a sea of white and whatever muscle group you're lighting up it needs to light up bright red in your mind and you get that extra mind muscle connection so it's almost you should feel like your phase one is a little bit closer to bodybuilding than it is like super <laughs> explosive lifting um, which is weird it's counterintuitive but in this initial phase there's plenty of reasons why we want our our um, our exercise to be more on that bodybuilder side yeah when you lay it out there it sounds exactly what it's supposed to be yeah so um then another reason why i decided to use isometrics first is i started to learn about rehab um, mm. a lot of good strength coaches 
should study as if they're physical therapists. Now, we're not the ones that are necessarily rehabbing injuries, but you want to start to think like that. And uh, what a lot of, for first of all, I mean, what are the injuries that we see over and over again in basketball? Patellar tendon issues, mm-hmm. Achilles tendon issues. And, you know, if they were to go to a physical therapist, one of the steps of rehabbing and strengthening would be isometrics. So let's find a pain-free angle, right? If my patellar tendon is hurting, let's find a knee angle that is pain-free that I could hold at. And then let's load at that angle. And then if I can get a little bit lower with that knee angle and still not feel pain, then let's get to that. Exactly. And then just progress you do. Yeah. So it's a very safe, easy way Mm. to start to like really build some stiffness and some strength in that tendon. Um, Now, not saying that that's where you stay forever. That's not going to prepare you for sports, obviously, but that would be that step one. And because I've noticed so many athletes do have some sort of patellar tendon or Achilles tendon issue and they're not necessarily acknowledging it, right? They're just like, oh, it's basketball. You know, my yeah. knees are just going to yeah. hurt. Jumpers it's whatever, knee. right? It's jumpers knee. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I've realized that you're better off going on that safe side and just assuming you probably have some sort of issue. Mm. And if there's all these other benefits of isometrics anyways, why not plug that in phase one and use it as like a, a way to sneak in a little bit of strengthening in those tendons. Exactly. Prehab, rehab. At, at low risk, mm-hmm. right? Good benefit, no real cost. Um, yeah, so there's, so those are probably the main reasons. And then the other reason is I started to learn about how, what I call functional stiffness, right? When, when you talk about stiffness, you can look at physiological stiffness. So that's like a change in the actual tissue. So like you're making the, the tendon itself stiffer. Mm-hmm. And then there's more functional stiffness where it's like, you're not actually changing the tissue, but you're teaching your nervous system how to activate muscles so that you can remain stiff, right? Yeah. So like stiffness as in like a single leg jump. If I go to take off and I sink low into my joints, that's poor stiffness. Mm -hmm. But if I have the ability to keep that minimal knee bend and just pop off the ground, think of like a high jumper, that is more, that is higher stiffness. Um, That is a very, very important aspect of athleticism is that, that ability to have that functional stiffness. And one way that we can build that is, uh, isometric training. Mm -hmm. So isometric training uh, for example, like if, if I were to hold a single leg, um, quarter squat position and I'm mimicking the knee angles that I use on my single leg jump and I, I, I so let's, whatever it is, let's say I jump at like a 60 degree knee angle. I can hold at that 60 degree knee angle and I can load up heavy with the dumbbells. That amortization phase is primed because I have so much strength at that knee angle. Mm-hmm. And, um, That is a huge thing, especially in single leg. It's like, it's almost like, hey, how much can you absorb? Because if I can absorb uh, uh, a lot of force in that bottom position, I can bring in more speed. Have you ever seen the kid who's like, they can't bring in speed and then you go, hey, go faster. And then they jump less. Mm -hmm. It's because the more they bring in, the more they have to absorb in that amortization phase. And they don't have that. They don't have that strength. And so they do better approaching from super low speeds. Exactly. That should never be a thing, right? So uh, we we need to build that ability and and um, and isometrics can do a really good job at that, especially because we can mimic certain joint yeah. angles. What led to you discovering this? Were you just sitting there analyzing film and you're like, wait a minute, this- and Yeah, then, I mean, the then... big thing was I'm always critically thinking about, I'm critically analyzing our programs and mm-hmm. I would, I, followed the trend of using that eccentric and then the more basketball i watch the more i realize we don't have that long slow eccentric like exactly. we do not have our muscles on as i'm dropping into that jump mm-hmm. if i did have my muscles on i wouldn't go anywhere i would stop myself in that upright position i would not drop down to the optimal joint angle so then eventually i realized i realized we're our muscles are more so off and it's more so how can we relax and then rapidly catch mm-hmm. ourselves at the bottom Right. So it's, um, that's kind of what I call, uh, the explosive isometric. It's, it's basically the, the amortization the phase. Return. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's just how much can you absorb in that and then d- redirect out of it. And so then I started realizing, well, I don't think we're doing that much from slowly lowering a weight. And so that's when I kind of started to shift things around. And I looked at all these other things, right. The tendon stuff that I talked about, owning positions and I go, what's something that, that does all of these things? Isometrics. Mm -hmm. Isometrics checks off all of these boxes that I want in a phase one. And so I switched it. And then the other reason 
why I put isometrics before eccentrics is what leads to muscle soreness, eccentric. I don't know exactly. the exact percentage, but I think it's well above 90% of soreness comes from the eccentric contraction. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that makes people sore is a new stimulus in general. So if I'm getting you on a brand new program, either way, it really doesn't matter what we do. Either way, you're going to be sore, sore because yeah. this is a brand new stimulus. So if I'm giving you this brand new stimulus and I'm emphasizing the eccentric, we're going to get a ton of soreness. And that is not good for <laughs> guys compliance. Are, yeah, instead of getting gains week one, you guys are getting, checking out week two. <laughs> yes. When you're overly sore, you're just pissed off and you just mm -hmm. don't come back. Exactly. Like, that if you're a trainer who's been training a lot of people, this is something that you know. The kids just go complain to their mom. It's affecting my yeah. game. I'm just not. Especially kids too, because they, they don't have the ability to differentiate the soreness and injury. Sometimes yeah. they're like, oh, I was doing the program and I got hurt. It's yeah. like, well, no, you just woke your muscles up for the first time in your life. Yep. So our program, even with the isometrics, people still get sore, mm -hmm. right? They still get sore, but it's not a debilitating soreness where it's like you can't sit down on your own toilet. Yeah. Like It's that feel-good soreness. Like, hey, yeah, I got some. And that's exactly what training should always be mm -hmm. is you feel like, hey, I did something, but I'm not that sore. Like if I wanted to go jump maximally right now without a warm-up, I probably could. Mm -hmm. You want to feel like that. Now, don't do that. Always warm up. But I'm saying you should have that feeling of like, you're not overly beat down. You're not overly sore. If you are overly sore, you probably did a little bit too much, right? Cut back a little bit. Um, because we basically how our body adapts is we need a stimulus that's just out of our reach. But if it's too far out of our reach, we just shut down and we don't actually adapt. Mm -hmm. So that is something where if you're throwing a brand new program at somebody and you're throwing the eccentrics, I think the soreness is so high. I think the muscle damage uh, at, I think the microscopic muscle damage, um, is so high that you're not going to be able to adapt to it. And so it might be week three until you start to be able to adapt to that. And then by the time week four comes around, we're supposed to be moving on to the next thing. So yeah. I found that, that, um, the isometrics provides the right amount of soreness, but not too much. Yeah. Plus definitely just like you touched on the beginning, the learning curve of trying to understand an isometric movement, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to an eccentric movement. Right. Um, yeah. So then the other things that we're looking at, we want some general uh, hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. Now, this depends. Like for the Vert Code Elite, if you're on the elite program, we're hoping that you are more of an elite athlete, right? We, you, you need, we, we say in the description, you need several years of experience. And so we assume that this isn't like your first program yeah, you ever. You know your way around right? a weight room. Yeah, you, you know, know a you squat, know. you know a hip hinge, you've yeah. built hypertrophy, right? Um, now, even with our NBA players, we're still doing a short hypertrophy phase, but it's, we're not as intense on it. Like we're just, uh, we're using it as a phase where if we put on a little bit of hypertrophy, it's good, but we're not trying to like transform your muscle size. Yeah. Right. So we have this four week phase where we do want to build a little bit of hypertrophy. And so that's why the time under tension is higher. Um, that's why reps would be a little bit higher. So it would be more of like a three sets of 12 type thing instead of what we were talking about with Galpin where it's max explosion and strength. Exactly. That's like sets under 10 seconds, right? So that's more so where you get into like the, the sets of two or three or four or five. Mm -hmm. Um, but like we're more in that hypertrophy rep range of anywhere from like eight all the way up to 15. And you'll see that further along in the program. What we were discussing with Galvin. Yeah, exactly. And that's typically how our program and how most programs mm -hmm. would work. Well-constructed ones. Yeah, well, con well, yeah, I shouldn't say most. I should <laughs> say the well-constructed ones are typically going to start with some higher reps. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to go down in reps as the program goes on. And as you go down in reps, you're going to go up in intensity. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes, like if you're looking at the training year, you're not going to keep going down the whole time. There are going to be periods where you say, oh, okay, I've been out of that hypertrophy phase for a little too long. Let's bring that back. And then you go back up in reps. And then you and then the next month you might go back down. And so you start to shift things around. Yeah. You're right? just, yeah, manipulating the stimulus base, you know, trying not to plateau after a certain amount of years for yep. sure. Yep, exactly. And then not all of it is necessarily block where you're just training a certain quality in a month, mm -hmm. right? It's also going to be within the days. So it's like Monday might be your super heavy strength day. And then Wednesday might be more of your hypertrophy day. There's a ton of different ways that we mix it up. But I just want people to understand generally, you are going to start higher rep and then you're going to build intensity as we move on. Mm -hmm. um, 
The other thing that we want to build that higher, higher reps helps us with is just general work capacity. So this is an area, if you weren't on the court, we would actually go for some low level jogs. It's good to build an aerobic base um, in that phase one. If you're on the court, you're already getting that aerobic base. So we don't even need to mess with that really. Uh, but general work capacity. So when we're doing these, these higher reps, uh, we're just building our ability to do work, which helps us later on because then fatigue doesn't get in the way. So like uh, Dr. Galpin was talking about, a, a, a huge component of building those fast twitch muscle fibers and building that explosive, strong nervous system uh, is low fatigue. So, but we're talking about sets under 10 seconds. Well, what if you get done with that 10 second set and you're completely gassed out and now you got to rest 10 minutes to get back to that same level? We don't have 10 minutes. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. So Four we need to be able, sessions. yeah, we need to be able to recover in two minutes. Right. So that's why work capacity early on matters. So then when we get into that super explosive stuff, we're not gassed out and our recovery times are shorter because none of us have four or five hours to sit there and, and train. <laughs> um, and then stability, balance, mobility. Mm. This is life. This goes on forever. Uh, but especially in that phase one, um, because we're trying to basically correct the issues that you have. If we don't correct the issues you have, you're not going to be able to continue through the program uh, because we don't add load to dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So everybody has some sort of dysfunction. It's just a matter of what it is. So some people uh, maybe don't have enough mobility. And that's why in the Vert Code videos tab, we have some self-mobility tests. Very simple. Yeah, let you, you know easy. where you're at. Yeah, let you know where you're at. Because I, I tell everybody, if you have enough mobility and flexibility, you won. We're not going to continue to go. Uh, we're not going to continue to build flexibility. We're just going to do our full range of motion strength training and we're going to do our dynamic warm up, and that's it. Mm. You can take away your static stretching. You can take away all of your other mobility work if you already have that. Um, but N name uh, a pro athlete that already has that. Cause just, I mean, there's, there's guys out there that are hyper mobile that people aren't aware of. I, I wouldn't know exactly who, uh, I mean, I know of our clients, I wouldn't yeah. say, um, I will say that. I actually went back in to our database the other day and there is a correlation in our database between the hypermobility and injuries. Exactly. Specifically the season ending injuries, mm -hmm. right? So, and this is well supported in the research. This is not just our database. This is well supported. Hypermobile athletes get hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, I think where people go wrong is some people, which some trainers still will say that you could get as flexible as possible, as mobile as possible, there's no effect. I've never heard somebody who's like really well-versed on both sides of the argument still stick with that. But there's a lot of trainers who just say, yeah, no, it's whatever, just get crazy flexible, Yeah, which I don't understand that. But uh, yeah, the research is very convincing that hypermobility is very bad for injuries. Now, where they go wrong, I think they look at it and go, well, if you're tight, you're going to strain more muscles. And that's probably true. You probably will strain more muscles, but the injuries that happened to the hypermobile guys, we're looking at ACL injuries. Exactly. We're looking at season ending, sometimes career ending injuries. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying you should be tight. I am saying if you gave me one athlete who's hypermobile, one athlete who's insanely tight, and you say, which one stays healthy? I'm going with the tight guy mm -hmm. any day of the week. And again, there's no, uh, there's no correlation between flexibility and vertical jump. The more research you do, you realize there is no correlation. Exactly. You could be tight and jump crazy high. You could be loose and jump crazy high. There is no correlation. So that is in our database and that is supported by the research. Um, I, I want you to have certain positions. My thing is I need you to drop into the correct positions. Mm -hmm. If you got that, then we won right? Um, now, a lot of people, I, I think, don't drop into the correct positions. Uh, and that's why we do a fair amount of mobility work, but it's specific to you. Exactly. That's why right? you got those it's not just, self tests. It's not just, hey, do this, mm -hmm. right? It's do this self test. And then, hey, if your ankles are tight, then yeah, let's do this ankle mobility. Um, so that is something that we take care of in phase one. We take care of it throughout the program, but you will notice uh, how we start with more mobility work and gradually as the phases go on, we go less and less and less. Because in my mind, if you went through all of these mobility drills, you probably built enough mobility. So we should start phasing off. And if you did go through these stretching and these mobility drills and you didn't improve, then stretching wasn't the issue in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Some people have these tight muscles that stretching is not going to cure. It's almost like 
uh, like you probably have some sort of bio, biomechanical issue. Like maybe your pelvis is forward tilted. And so you keep stretching your hamstrings. Your hamstrings <laughs> are already too long. Yeah. Right. So more stretching is probably the worst thing that you can do. It's like if you had a knot in a rope, and you just keep pulling it tighter and tighter. That's what stretching is. Mm -hmm. For for certain individuals, you just keep pulling it tighter and tighter. What happens to that knot? That exactly. knot just gets worse and worse and worse. So uh, my thought process on why we kind of taper off on the flexibility as the program goes on uh, is if you are doing this and you still haven't built, built an adequate amount, then it's not a stretching problem. Go see somebody. Go see somebody, and it's probably more of a strength training issue. A lot of times, mm -hmm. people are tight just because that muscle is weak. Um, so, yeah, uh, we phase one. Anyways, back to phase one. We kind of went, and we we need to do an entire episode on just flexibility. Yeah. Well, that's what we need to do <laughs> yeah. because people are still confused. Exactly. And, exactly. and the the problem is again going back to ten out of ten good trainers. You're gonna get nine of them who go, yeah, no, we don't, we want a certain amount, but we don't want to keep going. And then you're going to have one who just comes out and says, no, more flexibility is better. And then yeah. somebody's going to listen to them. And then it's exactly, gonna be a that's what I effect. think the most important thing you can take from this, this part of the conversation is that you are going to be different than the person next to you and the person next to you. Be self-aware with your own body. Yeah. Test yourself, learn from there, go from there and then, yeah. and then take you as an individual. And also realize, <laughs> one size does and not also fit realize where the research is at. Like the research is backing what i'm saying so the the issue is this people go but what about that guy that exactly. guy's flexible and that guy jumps high exactly. so that's flexibility leads to jumping higher <laughs> exactly. i had a pro dunker one of the best pro dunkers in the world he told me he said i said how did you improve your vertical and he goes i used to eat a lot of cereal <laughs> and he was dead Believe serious it. and I, I was still in high school so i knew this kid in high school he's now one of the best dunkers and I believed, I was like, well, he eats cereal and uh, he jumps high. Better start eating it's, cereal. It, I need to eat some more cereal. Mm -hmm. And and that's the issue, man. There's a lot of good pro dunkers and there's a lot of good NBA players. Actually, right now, think about the highest jumper you can think of. Okay. I think I know who you're talking about. That guy eats McDonald's every day and uh. he drinks soda on the bench. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not going to say any names. But like, should I go out and say, well, this pro dunker and then this highest jumper in the NBA, they both eat McDonald's every day. So McDonald's isn't bad for your vertical. No, it is. It's just for them, they have the <laughs> exactly. genetics to where it's not going to affect them, right? I, I love the quote. Uh, some great athletes are great despite what they do, exactly. not because of what they exactly. do. Exactly. And flexibility mm -hmm. is is one of those cases. Like they might be stretching every day and it's a placebo effect. They think it works. And so they go out and they preach it, but they don't understand there's these other factors that they, they might have a ton of fast switch muscle fibers. And so no matter what they did, they were going to jump high anyway. Exactly. Blessed. Um, yeah. Blessed. And so you cannot ever say, well, look at this guy, look at that guy. And then mm -hmm. a lot of people, right? A lot of people, they don't know. They do, if you do five different things, right, for recovery or whatever, you do five different things. You don't know which one thing made the difference, mm -hmm. right? They're not, sci these these guys aren't scientists. They're not isolating each exactly. individual doing variable. They're just studies. doing a bunch of stuff. And they're like, I do massage, I do ice, I do stretching. And then they're like, yeah, I think stretching really, really matters for recovery. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, maybe it was the massage, yeah. right? And the studies would back me on the fact that stretching is not good for recovery. It's not necessarily bad, but it does not decrease muscle soreness. This is fake news. Um, <laughs> Sound again, the alarm. We need. <laughs> I know that's that's what I. Yeah, after that one, you're gonna need a whole episode. So I know. Like, wait a minute. I know. Wait a minute. And and first of all, I'm saying all this stuff. We still do static stretching for some people, especially oh, yeah. if if they need to improve flexibility. Sure. Mm -hmm. But also for me, it's a way to get people to lay down for five to ten. Exactly. Minutes. That's arguably that's more of a because, more of an impact on recovery. Yeah. Just, exactly. Just, that's <laughs> what it is. Like. Uh, I, I would rather see you just lay down and in the vert code, we do belly breathing mm -hmm. after every workout, um, because we're in that sympathetic state and we do all of our recovery in parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. So how do I get to that rest and recovery after this workout where I'm still amped up or especially I was talking with an NBA player the other day about after games, he's like, dude, I'm so amped up for hours after the game. Imagine that you're playing in front exactly. of how many thousand people that is like the biggest stimulation you could ever have. And then we expect them to just turn it off right afterwards. That's not going to happen. So after games, you need some belly breathing. You got to figure out a way. Worst thing you could do is get in your car and listen to rap music. That's mm -hmm. what everybody does. But that keeps you hyped up. 
right? There's actually been some interesting studies on music and recovery and slower music gets you into that parasympathetic faster unless you enjoy slow music. And so then, like my fiance loves R&B. If she listens to R&B, that actually gets her hyped up yeah, more. Yeah, exactly. Gets her. <laughs> so that would keep her in her sympathetic, whereas for me, that would push me into the parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. For me, if I listen to any good rap, so you got to be mentally, mentally like self-aware. You got to be mentally and physically self-aware. <laughs> yeah, what calms you down? Yeah, exactly. That basically what, 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 what we're trying you. to say, what relaxes you? Okay, that's the best thing that you can do for recovery. Mm -hmm. And for some people, one, stretching has a nice little placebo effect. Placebo is real. If you think it works, it might. And so that is one reason I keep stretching uh, um, in our workouts. Uh, and then the other reason is it just gets them to lay down for 10 minutes and you can just relax and get into that parasympathetic. It's not the stretching, right? It's just the fact that you're laying there and, and, and relaxing. Um, we're going to do it. We need to do an entire, that yeah. might be, I think we have a guest next one. Maybe the next one we'll do, um, stretching episode. Try to find somebody, try to find that one guy. It's all stretch. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Now the other thing that we have to do with our phase one program is introduce elasticity. So you're looking at your future phases and you say, okay, what are we going to do in our future phases? So like in our uh, phase two, phase three, and phase four, we have, obviously we have plyometrics and so we need elasticity. Uh, but like in that phase, we don't want to go from, hey, I'm just doing strength training and I'm introducing my body to certain forces. And then all of a sudden I want my muscles and tendons to undergo spring forces. These are very different forces. So strength training, again, I've talked about this. Strength training is nice, but it doesn't fully prepare you for plyometrics. Plyometrics prepares you for plyometrics, but it's all about progressing lower level to higher level. Exactly. So we'll do a lot of low level jumping in our phase one. So we'll do like, think about the equivalent of like light jump roping, mm -hmm. right? We're introducing the tendons and the muscles to um, spring forces. We're not doing anything intense. Um, and then that's another reason why uh, pool workouts are a non-negotiable for me in phase one. I have to have it. I have to. That's one thing that I had in my first uh, program. And that's something that I still have in my program. And I always will. Yeah. Because that is the best way to introduce plyometrics and introduce elasticity without overloading too much. We're not getting the eccentric forces exactly. from the landing. Our bodies are so much lighter in water. And so we can start to um, introduce that elasticity and water just provides a different type of resistance that you can't get anywhere mm -hmm. else. So we'll do little things like we'll sit on the edge and go internal, external rotation. Uh, we'll do a lot of different stuff, wall side stuff with the hip, full range of motion through the hip where you're working against resistance the entire time, which we don't get that exactly. in the weight yeah, room. Yeah, you can't. Um, yeah, so that pool workout, our Wednesday pool workout is a non-negotiable for me. Now, I know a lot of kids don't, have access to a pool so we just increase um the reps on the mechanics but it, i i do let people know like it's it's, it's not the same exactly. you're missing yeah. out if you're not getting that pool find workout pool, find the public pool yep there's a pool somewhere yep and so we just keep it in our phase one a lot of people like it so much that they try to keep it in later phases which i'm fine with especially if you're going to go play a lot of basketball yeah and it's like hey i would like to still get some explosive stuff but i can't take those eccentric forces well hey take out one of our plyo phases and just put in that pool, pool. yeah because again it's like there's a reason why you know old people are in the pool <laughs> yeah. working out right Water it's robots, like, hey yeah i can get a good workout and it doesn't beat down my joints um yeah so you know those are those are some things that you got to keep in mind and so Eventually, I want to get, I think her name is Jill Cook. She does a lot of the, the very, very good research on tendons. And she's talking about jumper's knee comes from spring forces. So literally oh, yeah. jumping. Of course. Um, and so when we think of prehab, every strength coach is like, well, I just got to get the tendon stronger. That's an entirely different force. Yeah. So like there's spring forces, compressive forces, shear forces. We don't want to introduce one force and expect it to prevent an injury with an entirely different force. So like strength, it's going back to what I was just talking about. Strength training is essential in that phase one, especially because we need to build some general hypertrophy, build some muscles so that we can absorb more force. But we have to introduce elasticity because mm -hmm. we need the tendons uh, working as springs. It's just low level. And then let's gradually, let's go from level one to level two to level three. And what I mean by those levels... Um, Basically, what I'm talking about, level one 
would be like a jump and land. What I'm talking about, mm-hmm. like with our standing vertical jump or like a box jump. Uh, yeah. a box jump you're just jumping, jumping to on. a box mm. that is not really plyometrics plyometrics there's more of a intense stretch shortening cycle um it's just a jump and a stick right and then a level two would be a double jump and then a, a, a stick so or or you could even take out the stick but basically like if i were going to do hurdles i would jump over the hurdles and then i would land and do a little baby jump and then i would jump over the next hurdle mm-hmm. land do a baby jump so i'm doing two. like this little double mm-hmm. little double jump because then i'm not landing and You're, redirecting maximally yeah buffering before you redirect yeah mm-hmm. yeah so but i'm still sort of introducing that spring mm-hmm. because now it's not a stick and then a level three would be more of like your typical depth jump, mm. right? Or with the hurdle example, I'm going over and then quickly I'm getting off the ground exactly. maximally, quickly getting off the ground. Most athletes aren't quite ready for that. They're going to develop uh, some overuse injuries if they go straight into that mm. and they skip over that phase one or that phase two. Um, and I, th- I don't know who came up with that classification system. I learned it from Mike Boyle. Um, I think those were the three. And then for me, the level four, is getting into multi-direction. Okay. So then we're actually going like lateral to linear. We might be doing rotational stuff. Um, so we're we're adding a little bit of complexity to those jumps. Uh, but anyways, don't worry about that in your phase one. But in phase one, you need to have some sort of low-level jumping. Exactly. For me, we are going to do jump and land. And that's one, it's nice that we can get some, some regular jumps. That helps, but we're working on the mechanics. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope people are really appreciating when they're hearing all this, just why it takes so long to, to see results. I mean, and, and why it's so important yes. to be patient with the process, because if you, if you try and skip a step, you're, you're setting yourself up for either a debilitating injury, which is going to result in you having to go all the way back to before yep. the base to begin with, just to get back to the base, just to start again. Yes. So, so appreciate why you need to have that patience. And keep in mind, even our NBA players do this, mm-hmm. build the base oh, yeah. every off season, every they come off-season. back and they mm-hmm. do this. We do not, even though they're advanced, we don't throw them right back into level three plyometrics. Exactly. Uh, so this, this is like I get a lot of messages of like, "Hey, dude, I know you got this build the base phase, but I'm so advanced, yeah. bro. I'm so advanced. I don't need to do it, yeah. right? I was born with the base. Yeah, <laughs> like no. And, and that's the other thing is like, you know, this build the base phase is very different than your traditional build the base phase. So normally with your build the base phase, it's just like typical slow yeah. strength training, building some hypertrophy, which tempo. Th- that's yeah. fine. That's still very good. Uh, but this is very different. Um, and, and that's another reason why, even if you're advanced, you're going to build some qualities from this that you've never built before, Mm -hmm. because I guarantee you haven't done all of these exercises. These are, a lot of these are very specialized exercises. And so like the stuff with the feet, right? Like you're building strength in the feet, you're building strength in the ankles. Uh, this is all stuff that we got to go back and rebuild every single year. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the funny thing is, like, I built this thinking you're going to get no results yeah. in your four, first four weeks, but that's going to set up not only injury-free uh, injury free program uh, or reduce the risk of exactly. injury, uh, this is also going to amplify your gains later on. So, like, what we talk about with the isometrics, right? Okay, when I'm through phase four, my elasticity should be at an all-time high. But think about the slingshot example where... My right hand is holding the base of the slingshot. My left hand is pulling that band back, right? That's elasticity. What if this right hand wasn't strong enough and stable enough to hold that there? Now I'm pulling back with my left hand and my right hand comes with it. Gradually, yeah. So I'm not building elasticity because I didn't have the, uh, technically the isometric strength with that right hand, Exactly. right? So, hey, in phase one, let's build your isometric strength to a level that you've never built before. And now these muscles know how to isometrically lock up and then let the tendon truly um, um, stretch, mm-hmm. you know, and, and and act how they want to act to release the optimal amount of elastic energy, right? So it's the same thing. Like people are skipping forward and they may not have that isometric strength built to exactly. the level that they really should. So again, like when I put this out, it was like, I don't think people are going to gain. And I think that people are going to get frustrated because that's just what people do. Exactly. Especially <laughs> and nobody's, today's generation. Nobody's yeah. patient. They Instant just want results. a magic. Uh, but it is crazy the gains that we've got early on. I think it's what you were saying. Like, there's a lot of stuff in here that you've been missing out on. You've been having these energy leaks, uh, but also you're significantly improving 
uh, your mechanics. Mm -hmm. As long as you're paying attention to the mechanics guide and you're actually repping it out. That's the other thing I didn't mention. Along with our pool workout, we have a mechanics day uh, where we do a lot of different drills that I use to clean up mechanics that work really, really well because it's not something that puts it consciously right? I'm not telling you, exactly. I'm not, it's, I'm not telling you this is what you do. I'm just putting you in certain situations to figure it out yourself. And all of a sudden, when you figure it out, you skip that conscious stage. And now you've developed an aspect of mechanics and you can transform. Because remember, if I make it conscious, right? If you're looking at our uh, mechanics guide and I'm consciously teaching you, now it's going to take time mm -hmm. because now it's like, oh, I'm thinking about this. Exactly. And that could take a month before it fully builds back into that subconscious and you actually see the result. Yeah, that's so, incredibly important. Yeah. So I think that's the main thing is people are getting huge gains off mechanics, which is nice because then they could be a little bit more patient <laughs> while we're building the physiological exactly. base. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was some great information. I mean, if you, it's <laughs> yeah. so essential to just be able to stay patient, do that build the base phase and just know long term that's going to help you oh, out. Yeah. And for some people, four months or four weeks isn't enough, right? Oh, for, yeah. for some people, it's like, hey, I'm not all the way there and mm -hmm. I should probably stay here. Or you get into these other phases and you're like, ah, you know, I missed a week here. I missed a week there. I might just go back, back and redo yeah. everything. I think people overall need to stay a little bit more patient in exactly. the process consider the return on investment the more patient you are early on the more value it's going to have later yep all about yep. the roi exactly okay speed round speed round speed rounds are speed dangerous round. because i like to explain myself I know. what do i have i got 10 seconds yeah 10 seconds we got calvin on the timer too um I'm stressed bro I'm real quick stressed. rules uh okay no rules i'm stressing uh, no rules no rules okay you gotta let it out all right okay 10 seconds ready well, you got to answer. You got to ask the question before. Oh, I yeah. We're on best shooter you've ever seen. In person? In person. Ooh, Buddy Heald. Buddy Heald. Good answer. Uh, highest jumper you've ever worked with? Ooh, Cody Martin. Oh, impressive. Very touching on that 50. Yeah. He had that. I've had a few volleyball players that have, that have had the 50, but I worked with him long term. Mm. Yeah, so. Long Beach State Volleyball. Yeah. Um, best dunker you've ever seen in person? Best dunker in person, Chris Staples, by far. Chris Staples. And I would argue that he might be the best in the world. Best in the world. That's fair. Best dunker from Arizona. Best, uh, Mike Purdy. Ah, good. Yeah. By far. Used to hoop with him at 24 and Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. He's in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. Uh, toughest player you've ever played against? Toughest player. In a sanctioned game. Oh, dang. Do, do, I don't do, know. Do, do, do. Shabazz Napier, because he's tough. Oh, yeah. He's oh, tough. God. Tough I've stuff. played with, like I've played with on the same team as James, mm -hmm. but against, it's got to be probably Shabazz. Okay. Uh, best passer in NBA history? Best passer, Steve Nash. From a pure passing standpoint, I don't know, because maybe John Stockton, but he was so much more of an offensive threat mm. with his shooting that it made that his passing that much better. Yeah, I'll take Steve Nash all day. We're both from Arizona. Yeah. Uh, best team in NBA history? Best team in NBA history? I mean, maybe one of the old like Bill Russell teams or something, but that i've seen the warriors favorite animal i like squids i like <laughs> <laughs> i do i love squids i like whales i just watched blackfish on netflix that oh my gosh you have to watch oh, that that's it that's i love dogs good. um that's it if you could shut down any theme park what would it be shut down a uh, sea world you gotta go you gotta go no more sea world no more sea world these fish are as smart as us bro yeah. you got them in ca captivity it's tragic this it's is tragic. insane they're working on their balance in there though are they Oh, uh, jumping out of the water? Yeah. yeah. That's nice. That's the one benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise you've done the most in your entire life. Oh, my gosh. That is insanely hard. Uh, I would say rear foot elevated split squat. Okay. Over Like, that's one thing I've done my entire career, basically. Okay. Well, once I started learning how to train. Well, like, that's one thing that's in every phase for me. Have you ever dunked on somebody in a game? Um, pickup game. Yeah. Nice. Uh, well, remember when I played organized basketball, I couldn't dunk. That's right. <laughs> so I never right. had a chance to. But now I do it at any chance I get. How many kids are you gonna have? Um, probably three. It depends because I I need a boy. Mm -hmm. So if I get two girls, I'm gonna keep going. If I get three, I'm gonna keep going. For just like COVID. so, Galvin talked about the ability to uh, change in uh, the genetics of an embryo. Would you do that to make sure you had a boy and to engineer him to have bounce? 
I don't think I would engineer them to, because the studies aren't there yet. So I don't want to be, I don't, you don't want to be somebody trying stuff out with your kids. That's so right. if this was a hundred years later and they've been doing this and the studies show this is safe, then yeah, sure. What? I, I'm not going to be the experiment. That's right. Plus I can get my kid bounce <laughs> and my fiance has mad bounce. I'm actually mad about it. She has a standing 25 inch vertical. That's impressive. With no real training. That's impressive. Far beyond the WNBA level. I think it's what, two or three inches below the NBA average. And she doesn't train. She got on the just jump mat. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, you're gonna have like a 14. And I was like, it's, it's okay. And she just like poof, took off 25. Mm. And she trains with me. She has strength training stuff, but we're not training for bounce. She's just an athlete. She's way better of an athlete than I am genetically. What, so I'm, was I'm happy was that. her vertical the physical attribute that closed the deal for you? <laughs> I proposed that night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay. If you could, uh, if you had a scholarship to any school in the country, which school would you want it to be? Mm, I want to say ASU, but no Duke. Duke. Good. Um, should be U of A, but good. I'll take Duke. I'll take Duke. <laughs> That's over the last school. ASU That's the day. last school I'm going to. Bear down. If you could be the starting point guard in any NBA team, what would it be? Or who would it, who would it be? I would go to the Suns tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. One, because I grew up a huge Suns fan. And two, because I feel like they would actually give me some ball screens. <laughs> <laughs> if you give That's me right. enough ball screens, I'll go out. I'll, I'll, I'll throw up 20. If any given night. It might not be that efficient, but I'll go throw up twenty for Get the you. Twenty, and I feel like the Suns wouldn't care. They'd be exactly. like, "Yeah, dude, that's that's it's right. Whatever. That's right in their their uh, their plan as a organization." Yeah. Um, if you could add any physical attribute to your body, what would it be? Physical attribute? What do you mean? Well, for me, I would make my arms super long. Oh, some sort. Oh, yeah. No, I would definitely make my arms longer. That's it. <laughs> I would stay the same size. I would still stay 5'11", and I would just have like a 6'9 wingspan. Yeah, that's elite. Because I could still squeeze into like little spaces, and then I could extend rise, out. Extend you know how shifty out. I would be with 6'9 arms? Be, because people yeah. understand like AI yeah. had long arms, oh, like yeah. James has long mm -hmm. arms. Like these guys with long arms who are also shifty, they can extend mm -hmm. out so far. It, it makes them that much more most lethal. Of, yes. And then defensively, oh my gosh. Close out everything. Kill with those long arms. Most, yeah. Most most important physical attribute. Yeah. For a Hooper. Hmm. Like you don't block shots with your head. You block shots with your arms. So exactly. I don't really care about my height that much. Mm -hmm. Obviously, height's huge, but I would take the wingspan any day. Yeah. Steals, blocks. Yeah. Shooting, everything. Yep. If you could live anywhere in the in the world, where would it be? Man, I'm stressing. You go on vacation with James. I know. Barcelona. <laughs> See? Bar <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. Yeah. Barcelona. I love Barcelona. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I'm going there on my honeymoon, actually. Oh, perfect. Where else are you going? Italy. Mm, I don't even know. Italy, Ibiza, <laughs> Barcelona. We're going to like five dope places. Nice. I thought I, oh, fa uh, best rapper of all time. Best rapper of all time. Oh, no. This is like, oh, no. There's so do, many. Do, do. Ah. Do, do. Ah. Uh, Biggie. Oh, I said one. Andre 3000. Um, Nas. Tupac, because people get mad at me if I don't say him, but he is. But I will take Biggie. Biggie bar for bar. Biggie. Um, Pac is a better writer. Biggie is a better rapper. See, that's the thing. I like rapper rappers. So I'm looking at bars. I'm not looking at what impact. Like, that stuff's cool. <laughs> or like how good your albums were. Yeah. That stuff is cool, but I separate that from best rapper. Okay. Right? You might be the greatest rapper. I like what you're talking about. Yeah. So Tupac might be the greatest. But when I'm looking at just bar for bar, you look at Biggie, Andre, Nas. Um, Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne. Mm -hmm. Eminem. I never related to Eminem's bars, but from a lyrical standpoint, like, dude was crazy. Yeah. Still is crazy. Still is. Um, yeah. I would say those are my top five. Best fast food? Chick-fil-A. Okay. By far. Best fast food place open on Sundays. Ooh. I don't do any other fast food. <laughs> uh, is Chipotle fast food? Yeah. Yeah, Chipotle's so. up there. Chipotle counts. If I'm looking for something like I need a quick meal and I want it to be somewhat healthy, I'm going to Chipotle. Mm -hmm. At least they have real meat and That's you true. can choose what you want so I can get the black beans. It's in front of you. Yeah, like whatever if i'm low carb that day i could skip the rice if i'm Vegan. if i had a good yeah if i had a good w strength workout and i need the carbs i could get the rice i could get the veggies 
Like there's there's some decent yeah. stuff. I could skip the cheese and the sour cream, or if I want to cheat, I'll do it. Uh, they're, they're, like there's, I got options. Chipotle is diverse. Yeah. Sponsor Chipotle. Yeah, please. Sponsor speed round. Sponsored by Chipotle. <laughs> uh, last one. It's got to be good. Pressure's on you now. If you could put any player from the past into the present, who would it be and why? I would put Jordan because I want to know if he's the goat, goat, goat. I know he's the goat. I want to know if he's the goat, goat, goat. That's fair. Like, de- does he develop the three ball at the level that he mm. would need to to be the goat at, in today's game? And I think the answer is yes, but I don't know. And that's why I would put him in today's game. And that's I'd fair. put him on the Suns. <laughs> <laughs> So That's that he could just get max what touches. If he, what if he's just, what, he's just uh, a B version of Devin Booker on the oh, side? I'd be so mad. I'd be so. <laughs> See, mad. I got an argument to him. You know what I mean? Like he, if he was able to develop the three ball to that caliber, like why wasn't he able to just use his like super magical competitive powers to develop a ability to hit a baseball? Well, he was a pretty good baseball player for a basketball player. Yeah, I mean, I feel like any. You know. No, not anybody. Baseball is hard. Baseball is hard. Hitting the, the fact that he can make contact with a ball is impressive. Well, the catcher, you, you ain't seen Space Jam. They were telling him what was coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, no, that was that's impressive. Good, that added to his GOAT status, the fact that he walked away, hit a couple of baseballs, and then just came back. That's fair. But it also took away from his GOAT status with mm. how well the Bulls did. The mm. Bulls did really well when he was gone, which is why like people were hating on our comments about we think there's a ton of players today that could step in that. Yeah. But, like, I think people forget how good they were even without him. Exactly. Scottie Pippen was almost MVP. They're a solid all-around team. I think people, again, also underestimate just, like, the perception of it all. I mean, Jordan was, like, we were talking about off the air. Jordan was sports in the 90s. I I will put put Damian Lillard on that team. I still think they win five. Oh, yeah. I think they get five. Who who are they losing to? I don't know. I'm just, just saying. I'm just throwing out a number. I just just, think a, just a respect. Five. You just got to take Just out of respect. Yeah, I'm take, not going to say. Take oh, one away. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to episode six of the PJF podcast. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Hey, be sure to leave your questions and comments uh, below because we want to know what you guys want to know. Um, our next episodes uh, are going to be based on exactly what you guys want to hear. Uh, so let us know. Please leave us a rating and review. And as always, check out pjfperformance.net uh, if you are not already on the vert code. Let's get it.